Hi, I'm Rob Hirschfeld, CEO and co-founder of RackN, and this, the February 4th Cloud 2030 discussion, was about the pricing inflection and challenges of the major clouds uh, and what will disrupt their hold on the market, uh, put consumers back in control. Uh, and the short answer is not much, but uh, we have a conversation where we really talk about real issues in this, and then at the very end, we, we really decide that it does matter, um, that there are challenges. So um, you know, listen carefully, there's a lot there's a lot going on. We're going to keep talking about this topic. Uh, this bridges into more conversations, including like open source and, and a t standard stack that we'll, we will come back to. Um, enjoy the conversation. This was a great one as always. We've been talking about this inflection point of moving more control back to the consumer. So in the last in the last couple of weeks, and especially since the summit, one of the things that you know we've sort of identified is that right now the cloud companies have a lot of control over what gets built and how it gets built and, and what those models are. And then we added that OpEx thinking is driving people more dependency in that model where you're saying, hey, we're, you know, our innovation relies on the fact that I can rent infrastructure and not own it. Um, and what what I think we've seen more broadly is that that is translated to the cloud companies have a, like, having a lot of power in the customer relationship. And a question to me for 2030 is, can that change? <laughs> Will that change? And if so, what is the mechanisms that allow that to change? Um, Right? Is it is it something like having more edge technologies coming? Is it some other component? Um, and so, as a background, that's sort of um, since we're we since we're episodic, that's your um, recap. Now I play the theme music, and you get and we can go to the actual episode, right? Yeah. And yeah, from my perspective, I mean, I thought I've liked this subject matter for a while now, and and you and I have probably had several conversations about it over the course of the last two years. The basic logic is that um, if you're becoming a digitized company, more of a technology company with products rather than a product company that occasionally uses technology, then the basic assumption is that the amount of technology you'll be utilizing to make your company effective uh, will grow um, because right. it'll expand in new areas and create new opportunities for you. Um, and you'll begin to look more like um, what PayPal is to a bank. Um, or for that matter, even what a most modern, some of the most modern trading companies in the financial sector are, where they spend between 30 and 45% of their revenue on technology. Yeah. Uh, so when you think about the average manufacturing company, do they need to spend 30 or 40%? Probably not. But if they spend one and a half to three today, it's not far-fetched to think they might spend four to six after digital transformation. And so mm -hmm. <clears throat> if, if all we did was add 40 to 100% growth to the average IT organization over the course of the next five to 10 years as a result of digital transformation. And we only applied it to mm. half the companies in the world, we would still have an incredible increase in the amount of technology adoption. What the other part of that story is that if my, my basic assumption in the comment that um, Rob just reminded us of is that if technology becomes more of what drives your business, um, then it's more likely to that that technology is no longer an afterthought. It's not just plumbing anymore. If it's not just plumbing and it's key to your ability to do business and be successful, then you would think there's a higher likelihood that some or all of that technology will um, stay within your grubby little hands. Uh, and again, is that a perfect analogy? No, it's not, because even some of the bigger um, uh, internet oriented or digitally oriented companies today don't own all of their own technology or even the majority of it, but many of them do. So again, going back to the percentages, the law of numbers, if we look at 500,000 businesses around the world, which is a fairly easy number to pick because that's like the number of customers that Salesforce right. has or something, you know, that's a pretty easy number. Um, and you say that they're going to, you know, add 50% to their IT and then 25% of them will end up deciding to keep some or all or at least more of their IT than before. 
that seems to open up a significant number of doors to to uh, how we adopt technology, how we sell technology, um, and how we consider some level of independence from others dictating our path forward relative to technology use and its mm -hmm. cost. Right. So, I mean, we could go on and on. I mean, I could spend the whole hour oh, just that's... rambling on this, but I, I'll stop there and we can expand. I, I mean, what what you're, and I love the I love the the bottoms up analysis of the market, right? If there's so much more potential money, right, capital flowing in, into this, um, you know, it, it's it. That's I, I like the that approach. I think with Edge, it's going to be even more compelling um, from agree. that perspective because I think I the build out for Edge is is going to dwarf what we saw for cloud. Plus, I, um, I, at least at least initially, sorry, Rob, to cut in, but at least initially, <laughs> the variety of demand and the the potential um, inability to effectively translate that to an open, ready, perfect solution by an existing major cloud provider opens up a significant door for at least people to taste test in that environment. And then some, mm -hmm. again, some of them will end up saying, it isn't worth it, I'm not good at this, I'll let somebody else do it, even if it's a, even if it's a um, uh, uh, you know, lesser of two evils type of decision but many people will decide that this is an area where I can differentiate my business. This is, and because I'm differentiating my business, I should do my best to leverage this technology to the best possible way and maximize my return on investment. I'm, can, well, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go well, ahead, Greg. The uh, inner economist in me looks at this from a standpoint of scale effects. And so, you know, technology life cycles tend to be kind of compressed versus, you know, the traditional, you know, brick and mortar. So you've got this, you know, scarce power that creates a whole lot of wealth because a few people have it and they deploy it and they get incredible business advantages and they pay a lot for it. But then over time, other, you know, capabilities emerge and then this other stuff becomes a lot cheaper, right? So it's like the whole calculator issue, right? The, 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 those $300 calculators that are now free that sit on your, you know, computer. So I think we will have waves where a lot of wealth will get generated versus every new innovation, every new transformation, a lot of the initial costs are probably gonna be technical debt related, right? Because you've got older systems that were kind of doing some of this and then they're tied into other systems that are business critical and you can't turn them off because the business has to run. So you've got this juggling act that to me slows digital transformation because it makes it more complicated, more expensive than you know, just starting over for like a new company. So I think you're gonna see different ripple effects. One, smaller companies that are new and starting up are gonna have lower adoption costs you know, to trans, well, they won't really transform. They'll be part of the digital revolution. And then you're gonna have these big enterprises that will have to spend more even to get less initially. And then hopefully they get caught up and that's probably this edge dynamic mark that you're talking about where hmm. the stuff they have direct control over versus the things that are meted out to them by the different, uh, you know, as a service providers. But there's a downward pressure with adoption as, as because of the scale effects of technology, right? Especially around software and services where the incremental cost of each additional person creates a downward pricing pressure. So things can get cheaper over time. And then you have new competitors and new innovations that have more value. And then so people have to cut their price further. I think this is a new era we're entering that's a lot different than when, you know, um, Salesforce and Oracle had huge amounts of advantages because of the their technology and how deeply integrated it it became in the organization. And I think, you know, there's going to be other types of SaaS that are easier to adopt that do, you know, specific things, and they'll be, they'll be cheaper and faster, in my opinion. I, the, I, I agree with you about commoditization of what's going on with cloud. Um, I, and this is, this to me is part of the, 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 the not to untangle because it should be that, and this is why I was so concerned about the OPEX change to innovation cycles. It should be that the things that the cloud providers are doing become commoditized. 
um, and people people replicate what what they're doing because right nobody needs all of the services that Amazon <laughs> has been adding. Although with the long tail, probably most of their customer, you know, a lot of their customers do need some of those services. Um, but it it's it seemed to me that it it should be that you know eventually infrastructure and software become you know sort of a, a unit that you can use uh on tuesday we were talking about the lamp stack and how the lamp stack created this you know just huge spreading of oh i know how to build a website i have the standard architecture yeah. stack i know what to do and then that led this huge expo explosion of linux users um and I, I, you know, I don't, I, I feel like that could happen um, in, in the markets that we're talking about, but I, right now I don't see, I don't see where the wedge would come in um, from a tech perspective. Like we're talking, I mean, edge, there, there, it doesn't look like there's going to be an edge stack emerge. I mean, I'm looking at, at Mark in this case. Uh, yeah, it, I, it, yeah, I don't, I don't know um, that there's going to be and edge stack, right? I, and I don't know that, in fact, what I do know is that nobody knows that right now. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, no matter what anybody says, nobody knows that. I, uh, uh, and again, this is probably a conversation that Rob and I have had and maybe some other folks that are on the call today, but um, one of the interesting aspects of, of edge is that, you know, Cloudflare has some great solutions. Yeah. And they've designed around a specific delivery and support model for what can run in their environment. Um, uh, Talbyte has a great, uh, easy to use, easy to adopt cloud-like uh, solution for the edge, but it's not gonna be what will be used for every analytics workload. Um, heavy analytics workload, where you're looking at high density of compute and, um, and storage as close as possible to that compute um, is gonna be a unique workload and probably unique design requirements, probably not if for the most part, um, uh, just um, uh, Lambda or um, something like that. So uh, between the ability to use containers, microservices, um, uh, WASM, um, uh, even, even VMs in a distributed architecture for just infrastructure um, across a wide range of locations, um, there is no one way to deploy, and what will happen first, at least in my opinion, what will happen first is the things that make people money right now. And some of those will take hold, like in everything we've ever done, some of those will take hold and grow uh, and yeah. become more important. Some of them will will adapt um, and uh, um, or or die. And um, the, but the idea that the the, I think this is one of the biggest questions is that we don't know enough about the environment today for um, anyone with confidence to be able to go to an enterprise and say, look, if you use Wavelength, we'll eventually have you everywhere you need to go and you'll have all of the solution you need. Okay, you'll have all the solution I need for 20% of my workloads <laughs> at a price that's 40% higher than if I did it myself. How is that a positive solution? I'm not saying there won't be solutions that'll work for where the location is a perfect fit and speed to value is more important than designing your own environment. It'll probably work for many workloads, but um, there is there is no one right now who can say that whether it's Anthos or, or, or Huawei's private stack or Ali Cloud's, uh, Ali Cloud plans to do 5 million edge locations in China alone. And yet they're not gonna be the only one. Right. So um, I, I just I don't know what the right answer here, guys. I mean, these, these this is the whole point of these conversations is that I just see that there's an enormous amount of opportunity here. And one of the things that that I'm trying to drive with some of the folks that are are willing to partner with Tiny Little Edge Vana is how do we co-market? How do we help educate the market in even getting out there and making determinations on what can work for what solution and why is it worth approaching now versus waiting two years? Take a step back. Um, just in terms of how I evaluate markets, um, when I'm valuing markets, I'm thinking of uh, in terms of how many players are going to be 
can be dominant. So basically, can there be a, is it going to be an oligopoly or not? So is it is it going to be just dominated by AWS or a couple of companies? Is it going to be dominated by just is it just going to be a cloud market? Or is it going to be a cloud market or an, an edge market? Um, is it going to be like defined by one industry or is it going to be defined by multiple industries? Uh, is it going to be defined as, uh, are you going to, are there going to be specialists in terms that are focused on different use cases? Are there going to be specialists that focus mm. on, and are those use cases going to be based off of geography? I mean, basically, is there, going to be spe- is there going to be competition based off geography? So basically data locality is important. So in this, in this case, is it good? Is it going to be based off of um, uh, industry in terms of industry vertical, healthcare specialization? So, enough, is it going to be based off of company size? So, are there going to, are there going to be um, industries that focus on SMEs, on enterprise use cases? Uh, are large enterprises mm. going to handle these issues themselves? I mean, these are all issues that matter a lot in terms of how the competition is going to actually happen. In the case of like cloud, are it, are they going to run? Your, are, are people going to create their own data centers and buy their own infrastructure, or they're going to use a third party? These are all relevant so, in terms of how the whole I, entire marketplace. Go, go ahead, Mike, and then I have a question too. Uh, I think I think Lawrence is Lawrence is on to something that's going to be really interesting as we, as we look not only, not only near term, but long term, which is we've looked at, you know, we've, we've seen the cloud, what we've seen the cloud build up till now. And you, you know, and we've, and we just assume that it's going to look a lot like the original, you know, the overall team, the one that we already know. And what I'm seeing, what I'm starting to see play out is, closer to what Lawrence is talking about, which is you're going to have Amazon and Microsoft at that very, very top level, right? Um, sure. Google, Google, um, you know, they're going to struggle to compete. They're going to struggle to compete at that level, uh, but they don't have the, inter- the you know, that entrenched enterprise uh, base that those, that those two have, right? They don't have the same, the same heft. So um, they straddle this, this sort of, next level which which you know google's sort of in its own special case but then you've got a next Uh level sort of the purgatory of the cloud which is ibm oracle hp sap all the existing players that don't have anywhere near the heft and aren't going to catch up to amazon and microsoft right and don't Uh have the ability the agility to compete against the incumbents um so their slice of the market is going to be much much smaller but like lawrence says where they're strong is in some of these verticals right they own a lot of these industries that an amazon or a microsoft it's harder for them to to break to break into there and then you've got the alternative you know that alternative level um that you know with that's Linode, do ovh which hates what getting put into this category which is why i do it it's just fun (laughs) um (laughs) that's her rack space you know equinix and pack it a little bit and up cloud um but they're you know they're never going to compete against any of them nor should they but they right. look really really attractive when it comes down to things like multi-cloud or um right uh you know and i don't mean multi-cloud shifting data all over the place but when you look at edge okay we're talking about cost i don't need to you know an amazon you know an amazon level to host a little bit you know host object data right i can i can actually look for a lower cost provider there that and then it gets into things like trust i think this gets really interesting on what the future of our you know of this of this industry looks like and yeah basically that goes to so i think greg you're a marketer also right yeah i mean basically in terms of on the internet yeah in terms of markets you always want to be number one or number two in your market so you basically define the market down until until you're number one and number two so it's uh yeah there's niche niche, how could you 
Matt, Matt, wait, Matt wait. AC had a great line, right? And, and we're in the, we're in this part right now. Bigger, yeah. bigger pie, right? You would it's, you would be needing you would be wanting to identify the biggest slice of a common pain or need, you know, that's unmet by the current mix that Mike just you know laid out. You you would you would want. <laughs> You would look, what is it, the underserved part that could also be linked by APIs or whatever into other aspects, you know, the, the new stack, right? The new edge stack. And so what's missing to bring that about, to make it easy? But unfortunately, we don't have a Linux type player that I know of. I mean, I guess you could kind of say Google to some extent is, you know, their model, but you know, with the LAMP stack, you had Linux, right? And it was distributed and available. Mm -hmm. People could do a lot of things with it, with Apache. You know, I, but I don't know. Do you have any type of altruistic player that's in a slice that's broadly underserved where they could get enough traction and, and growth to compete? Yeah, there's, a, there's an interesting open source question in the, in the middle of this that I would, I would pause for a second. Um, because I, I think there's a different thing to dig into first uh, before we go to the analogy on the lamp stack, which I like. Um, but there was something that Lawrence was saying, and Mike, you you came back to this a little bit, which has me, when we define edge, we we conflate two different types of edge in this, in this conversation. And I, I think this has been an ongoing challenge. There's an edge commonality question that we're talking about where you have a hospital, like all the hospitals want to have their own infrastructure. Hey, Simon's coming. Um, they, they want to have, like, we want to have a way to have an edge facility that is a self-contained edge facility or edge self-contained site, what we probably would have called private cloud back in the day. And, and have that repeated over and over and over again. So there's this idea that we're going to have, you know, localized infrastructure with a repeatable pattern so that it operates consistently as a market. Something that VMware start, did, but didn't do well enough. That's right. And then we have this other idea of edge ubiquity where we're saying, I actually have an application that is in edge sites distributed like SDN is today, where the value of the, the edge infrastructure is the fact that I have edge that one application in in a whole bunch of different locations acting as a single location sdn's the perfect example for that but there's you know if you ended up with um you know more more things that have very tight you know when, when we get real ar vr integrations or real voice and camera stuff and you know autonomous cars and things like that the application is going to be everywhere but it's going to be hyper local from a from an operations perspective. So it'll be a ubiquitous app, ubiquitous vendor. Um, and I, I think that we're still we're still struggling with both of those things. But I'm thinking that they're different. They're actually different problems. Um, yeah, one's a, one's a, one's a business problem. The other one's going to be a deployment and management problem. And then in the deployment and management problem, yeah, you know, it's sort of what you. It's pretty much right in your in your wheelhouse what you do. But that gets a. Yeah. That's that's going to get messier before it gets cleaner. I there the funny thing is I'm not sure that they're really that they're, that you know it, it occurs to me that we we can we conflate them in conversations and I, I actually think that the commonality problem is yeah we have to solve them both and I, maybe maybe we can solve them together I mean I know Rackin would love to but um, the it it. It strikes me when I step back at it, right? The the lock in from a cloud. I, I, I still wonder, right? Lock in sometimes I think is real, and sometimes I think it's not real. And it's it's real. It's not it's not real until something's happening in the your provider of choice that causes you to, you know, regret that decision. Um, like it's not real until it is. Um, like a lot, you know, for Elastic last week, or um, you know, Netflix competing with Prime. Um, right. It wasn't a problem until it was. Um, but then we, we're not, we're not, we're not going to drift to standards no matter what we do. And then that means that we're going to be dealing with a heterogeneous, heterogeneous, heterogeneous yeah. environment. Um, and, and, 
which bring, brings us back to lock, lock in provides a benefit for that. Um, oh, which Wait, then uh, hampers innovation. So, yeah. Um, now, I, I, always, I, have, I had this like crystal clear idea in my head about this ubiquity and, and commonality. And then, you know, the, the, for power to get back into the, the consumer's hands, which is where we started, we have to have a way that, you know, you can worry about what your, your layer is on top of this and, and then not have to be locked into a provider on that. What that gets back to what Lawrence and I were, were, were arguing about is okay. people are going to, end, you know, people are going to end up where, you know, at, at the, at the strata of the ecosystem or the provider that they, you know, that fits their business the best. For some of them, it's going to be, we need all the breadth of an Amazon and all the security of an Amazon. And I'm okay being locked in, maybe not technically locked in, but I put all my chips in and it's, I've made my bet and I'm, it's too costly to, to fold at this point, right? Some are going to be, you know, some are gonna say, I have to be at an IBM. I need all of their, you know, I need all of, well, they might not say that. Okay. Maybe I'll be at an SAP, right? I need to be in an IBM because I need all of the, that industry knowledge around retail uh, to compete because I also, also because I'm not going to go to Amazon because I don't feel like feeding the hand that's killing me at the same time. Right. So there's a huge business trust challenge here. And then there are going to be the, you know, others that are going to be like, I don't care where my stuff is. I just want it cheap and easy and open and be able to just run my stuff. It goes to, uh, I think it was Mark talking or Greg talking about it earlier um, of, you know, the, the companies that are, you know, that are, I don't know if I need to be all in, don't know where I need to be. I don't need, you know, the construction company. I don't need to spend $30 million on this. I need to spend $300,000 on this. It still seems like it's a costly, complex problem and that the infrastructure as a service problem got solved with a ton of cash that came in. And I think Rob and I were pinging on this a little bit before the call, but it came from other places, you know, and so it gave them this the sheer amount of investment. And even when you look at the lower end, you know, into the oracles of the world, right there, they're, they made investments to probably to protect revenue more than to become a new, you know, cloud player. But they had a huge amount of, you know, uh, uh, proprietary revenue. You know, they 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 had they had a source. But when you go out to the edge, who is it? And I thought if one person, one company could do this, I thought it would be potentially VMware. You know, because they weren't there, and they were all, and then you know, between virtual desktops, desktops and virtualization, maybe there's a critical mass that could be created by an ecosystem. But they went for right the, the cloud too, and didn't do so well. So uh, I, I do think you need to have some type of lock-in for this to work. Otherwise, you'll you, you never get the, the marketing momentum to invest in the product, the security, you know, all of those things that, that need to scale, they, they don't scale by themselves. You know? yes. uh, uh, sorry, Rocky, I, go. Well, I was just gonna point out that uh, something we might wanna look at a little bit more closely is this application we're using right now, suddenly Zoom is the de facto default. And it took a crisis and them being in the right place at the right time. But at some point, some large company is most likely gonna buy them or they're going to actually be able to fend them off. But the whole way video conferencing suddenly became ubiquitous. So we're talking Mike's ubiquity again, and we're talking the technology. So just keep Zoom in mind and what alternatives were there before and what alternatives might be there in the future and how this will continue to play out. Uh, Rocky. So I, I didn't, so basically this is a, a, a communication, a chat protocol called Matrix that's being, um, that's used in a, a chat app called Riot, competes versus Signal and it's very popular. It's used in, uh, especially in the open source community. And basically um, it got shut down for two days by Google last week. Um, and that 
it's a big deal because it's the uh, same thing, same issues with the Google being shut down, like Telegram or everything like this. So it's the same thing so with the why did, parlor did, issue. Why oh they got shut down from a from a from a speech safety a speech violence issue. issue? Okay. Um, and it's um and then they got put back up. Basically, they didn't. Someone at Google didn't know that they actually had a, an enforceable um, monitoring system. And it was specialized. They, they were doing everything right, but um, it just showed that Google was able to shut it down. Matrix, I'm mentioning this because they have a, this, it's worth looking at, looking at um, something that I've been following for a while. And it's um, very popular in this in the FOSDEM community. FOSDEM being this uh, the Belgium annual open source conference. Is, is this the is this, uh, Lawrence? Is this the matrix uh, that is the underpinning of the element? Yes, um, exactly. Ah, because that's one of the the key uh, distributed web technologies. Well, it's a, yeah, and, and it's been used kind of as a as an alternative to Slack and, and for both for individual messaging, but also for group messaging. And it, it comes with a good deal of, of baggage. Some of it, not that all that savory. So that's probably why it got the, it, I didn't hear that it had been, it had been uh, kind of dropped um, out. So I, I didn't know all that bag. I didn't know about all the baggage. I, um, I, uh, all these things have baggage. I, uh, <laughs> gosh, I, uh, but, but that's the point. <clears throat> all these, I'm, what are you supposed to do? Trying to have a, an alternative to, uh, Zoom. Well, I mean, it's, it's not really that sticky. I mean, they're good, but, there are real alternatives and having, you know, I, we've, we're starting to see some ones that are coming in yeah. that have, um, you know, better dynamics for even this type of conversation than, than what Zoom has. Zoom has. Have you, have you seen a team flow HQ? Which one? The, go look at team flow HQ. Hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> it's pretty awesome. So you go and you design your office building and whenever you're in a build, in a room with people, you can hear them and, your video turns on, you can shed all forms of docs and stuff. It's pretty cool screens. Yeah. Gather does that too. I, I think yeah, I think I'm, I'm sure there'll be a bunch. Right. <clears throat> Toucan, there's one I've heard of called Toucan. There's another one. There's there's a couple of them coming that seem much more natural from yeah. like so for this, like it would be perfectly reasonable for this to be a room in my off my virtual office that people could yeah. come to. Right. Um, and you know, one of the things that we're looking at speaking of chat apps, like Slack um, is one, very expensive. Slack, um, I mean, all these is, yeah, there's no, they, they've singularly failed to innovate around this whole thing, right? Yeah, and, and there's so many well, ways that, that, that we, would, voice we would, tools. I, well, we want to integrate, right, we want to integrate chat, we want to integrate video, we want to, you know, it's, screen and, sharing documents, the works. <clears throat> yeah, and, and guests. I mean, the, yeah, the, and like the thing that drives me That's nuts right. there is guests. It's super hard to have guests. Right. And when you have guests running around your room, they shouldn't be able to hear stuff and whatever else. Yeah. Yeah. We're complaining this for Zoom had cracked the nut for years. Zoom was the best alternative to, to everything mm -hmm. else on the market. That's right. Yeah. I mean, remember when we used to complain about Skype? <laughs> and webex right. and well WebEx. this is but but this is the it's idea with, how... with with innovation yeah. right they're they're the the idea of reducing the barriers to getting delivery yeah. is a critical yeah. a critical critical thing um that's why i get nervous around this whole idea that amazon can be displaced i mean frankly well, right can't. this is because it's just, so easy just to just try to move your billion row database just try it. Uh, but you don't have to, I mean, the, we don't have to move a, a database. I mean, you can connect to it until it okay. becomes a latency problem. It, but then, then your whole application is You're right. So what they'll do is move up stack. 
to rich share and merge share service interfaces, which are totally sticky. And once you make the call, you're there forever. It, it's going to be that way. I mean, <clears throat> once you start using sort of Redshift and relying <laughs> on the features of Redshift, you are there forever. That's yeah. it. Even Just, the name scares the shit out of me. And and, it, <laughs> and 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 the the price you end up paying for that is just, yeah. Well, it's, it's, well, the price is. I think there will be. I mean, if they ever get radically out of control, then government will get called in or something. But you know, you're there. Yeah. You know? it's, and it's, I that think you know. So not doing that—that that is insisting on doing your own thing. You'll probably screw it up. Um, you mm -hmm. won't scale as well, and it'll be more expensive in the long run. Well, at least maybe. This that that the question the thing that I think is an industry falling on its own sword problem, Simon, is the assumption that you can't do it as well and you won't scale as well. This, uh, this to me is where it's so it's so broken. There is no, I mean, there is no org that runs databases that can do a billion row database. Yeah, but but why why I mean, all right, so answer me this. Why is it that running a billion row database requires PhDs in operations? I mean, is that something that's just inherent in the, the fact that this is the tech or is it inherent that we're not spending the time operationalizing? To my mind, there are a couple of things going on which we haven't mentioned. One is there is a major de-skilling of IT. Okay. <clears throat> and if you go to my kids or your kids and say, you know, how do you build such and such a thing? Even if they've been to computers, you know, done computer science, they don't know how. They were born when the cloud was up and running, and for them, this is harder stuff, right? So, <clears throat> you know, it makes sense that IT as a consumable, I need a function, right? I need a database or whatever, um, becomes a thing for them. And it's a way to deliver it. And then having a few orgs which are really good at it, that makes sense, right? Whether it's Oracle, Amazon. So, <clears throat> you know, the idea that you are an expert in running databases is a core, right? Is a core to your business. It probably isn't. So I think once you make, but, but it is the case that we won't have standards from the cloud guys. So, Mm -hmm. Whichever one you choose for a function like a database, you, you're in. Or at least the cost of moving will be high. I... So I... And many edge apps, I think, will be the ones that see lots of data, right? And if they're seeing lots of data, they're going to use traditional, well, I mean, the cloud services that are provided by the big guys. And so once you start to do that, it, it, it gets hard. That is, you can see how an Amazon <laughs> offering, an Edge offering, or an Azure or whatever, you know, that becomes more and more tempting. Or... But then, I mean, this, this, is, this is where it's interesting, because what you just described is sort of how we got legacy infrastructure already. You get locked in because you don't have the skills or because you've, you've, you've invested. And then you get somebody like what Swim's doing, and it's like, hey, we have a database that doesn't require all that stuff. We have a way to, to not have, right? So there's a, there's a, instead of Redshift being the thing that gets pulled back into on-premises software, could be that that's, that's already there. And then the next group of nimble companies is going to show up and saying, you know what? We didn't, we, we figured out an easier way to move this data. We didn't need it. Um, well, the thing about, yeah. I, I think we're moving from a point where you had legacy software and you didn't move it up in functionality, right? Because it ran forever. And yeah. now, well, what Amazon does or whoever, the cloud guy, is modified functionality continuously under your feet. <clears throat> so Redshift might go from a million rows to a billion rows capability-wise you didn't necessarily see an interface change. You just use it. And they are better at delivering backups and snapshots and availability guarantees and all those things, right? So those become more, those will improve all the time. 
I so is there an off ramp? I mean, from that perspective, why do you why do you want one? I mean, it seems to me that we're still trying to get people onto the cloud, and here we are worrying about off ramps. We haven't um, got a cloud pricing issue. We have kind of, but we know where the barriers are, and <clears throat> you know we're we're all foaming in the mouth about lock in, but probably would be better security wise than a bunch of other ways if we could just get people on the cloud. Um, Who are you trying to get on the cloud? A bunch of crap that's still running on-prem. To be honest, there's a bunch of stuff that's running on-prem that people are fulminating about security wise. I'm not going to let this run in the cloud. It's all nonsense. It's just people who are afraid of losing control. Those are Hmm. Are those the last 30%? The, the well, late adopters? I'm sure there's a bunch of apps that are very hard to move, by the way. I'm, so I'm not trying to make it easy, well, sound easy. But I mean, and by the way, edge or cloud, I mean, somebody else's infrastructure, right? Right. And then you pick the level of infrastructure service that will represent your needs. But, you know, people running around in data centers, tripping over Ethernet cables, uh, what's the point? Well, you're, but you're describing cloud in a generalized dynamic infrastructure sense, and yep. I'm hearing it as one of three providers. And and so so the the question that you're asking, I think, is different. By the way, that I'm, that's for an app. I think the cloud. I mean, we yeah. remember three or four years ago, we went through this thing, which was, I'm going to choose Azure for my cloud for all my whole for my whole company. Well, that, right. we know that idea, that idea is, is a non-starter. You're going to choose it per app. You will choose the right cloud for each app, right? right. So what you're, what you're oh, describing wait, is fundamentally... I see, I see it. That's fabulous. I, I love the disagreement. Because uh, I see yeah. some orgs where they have made that choice. We're in Azure cloud. But I oh. see others where it's per app. Yeah, I mean, I, but I, we, um, we kind of jump by some stuff, and I guess we can't focus on every item that's brought up, but there, there was a lot to unpack with what you said before, Simon. And, and while oh, I agree sorry. with you, uh, no, no, it's good. I mean, you bring up a lot of worthy of a whole nother uh, hour um, on this uh, um, platform, but there, there are a lot of uh, assumptions and truths about where infrastructure is. One of the assumptions or not assumptions, one of the truths that a lot of people don't understand because of the visibility of cloud and the size of the cloud operators is how much of what's on cloud now is net new workloads and how much of what was originally on premises is actually in public cloud now. And that yeah. number is still below 20%. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, probably closer to 15%. So what um, that says is that SaaS has been the predominant net new, right? Um, well, SaaS uh, potentially, um, but no, I mean, even net new apps that are custom built by, um, by their owners on oh, cloud see. platforms, right? Right. Um, because, okay. uh, you know, it's like anything. I mean, we're talking about the Jevons paradox effect, right? You make it easier right. to solve for a problem and people solve for more problems. Yeah. Um, but the other part is that it's, while I agree with you and have made that same argument publicly that um, many folks use excuses for why they don't up, adopt a cloud for an application rather than reality, like it's not good security or they, they can't get the compliance they want or yeah. um, whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, and that's all true. But it's also true that on the other side of that coin, there are some apps that from a money perspective, it just doesn't make sense to move, right? Um, right? There, there is no value from the cloud. Um, and so operating it on premises until it decides to die is the right thing to do. Uh, and there are also a significant number, and it's not, and I'm not trying to say that, you know, oh, it, this is evidence that cloud is dying. Quite the contrary. As with every or every solution, there is a maturity curve. Yeah. And as customers get to a point where they realize that they can offer a, um, a quality of service at a price point that uh, makes sense for them um, from a scale perspective, then they will do it themselves. And you know that's been evidenced by any number of uh, large and small companies that have taken work and put it back on the equivalent of on-premises. Yeah, but they have to, but they have to have a 
a super modern skill set and sure. an application in enormous scale, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. They, they do today, but I would argue that the natural trend here would be that's that should that should become less of a of an of a you know specialized thing, and that there's there really shouldn't be anything that keeps us from from the standard processes and practices that are refined in, in the cloud, moving back into self-managed <clears throat> infrastructure, right? Right, except for the redshift argument, right? Which is- Even, even the redshift argument becomes like an Oracle argument. There should be somebody who's willing yeah. to come in, Snowflake, right? But Snowflake is cloud only. This is, this is, this is where, I, but, because when I look at this, this is where it gets really interesting, right? Snowflake, is not a on-premises self-managed right. thing. They chose it to be a SaaS in part because that eliminated them having to deal with their customers' operational capabilities. Mm -hmm. it, you know, somebody could take what they're doing and make it operational on-premises and then it's buy hardware, mm -hmm. fixed investment, buy software, right? run it yourself. And at certain scales, even potentially medium scales, that shouldn't, it shouldn't be overwhelmingly bad. No, well, no, it shouldn't. But we've but, but we're but, but it SaaS to... is really easy, right? So, I mean, consuming a SaaS-based database or something is arguably much, much easier. <clears throat> and so, why would you? Then this is this is the trend line, and and my my point from. A couple of weeks ago was that we've built our op, our re, our research and development designs around that assumption. Yeah, you're right. Right. So yeah. at this point, we're saying I wouldn't even innovate new technology in a way that that I had to do things like that myself. Re restate the assumption, Rob, that you're talking about. The when we were talking the opex capex conversation, and we said, "Hey, we've moved everything to this opex thinking." What where I went. Beyond that is our R and D designs are are integrated into our OpEx thinking also. So when somebody builds a new service or offers something new, the design fun, the first design is well, I don't have to build this. I can rent that. I can I can OpEx that. And so when you build that innovation or you build that new product, it's already tied into exactly what Simon's talking about. It's like well, I, I, I'm Redshift right from the start and. That, that innovation is now tied into these service provider models. The idea that yeah, I'm I gonna... also think, I mean, from yeah. the from the capabilities provider perspective, I mean, how many companies are there still at an Oracle that will sell you a database that runs on-prem? Very few. And that's because the cost of sale is high and PS dominates and whatever else, right? So from the vendor side, it's far easier in a way mm -hmm. to offer everything as SaaS. Um, and I think many of the infrastructure startups you've seen are gonna die because infrastructure is just moving up, right? So for example, security for Kubernetes, there are a bazillion of them out there. It's just gonna happen. It's gonna happen from the majors, right? I, it needs to be, it needs to happen as part of the, the soft. This is where Kubernetes is at risk, frankly, because the majors have no incentive to make Kubernetes itself include those features. They have those. Or should services. they do? Should they do? They want to offer a secure Kubernetes service. They do, but they're not going to put that back into Kubernetes. So Kubernetes itself as a platform yeah. will Maybe. have security hooks, but the security Maybe. services uh, will be yeah. built into the... Uh, Maybe. Yeah, but this is where I was talking to Mark about this the other day. Um, there still has to be on-site services being being dealt with in terms of the hardware, and yeah. the services are just going to be uh, given to being given to service providers, small, say, cloud service providers, the people managing the Kubernetes service providers, the managed service providers, not necessarily the the small enterprises that are using those services. Well, and that's the Somebody answer. Somebody has play, right? to, be, to be managing the machines. So mm -hmm. guys, I, I know we, um, guys and gals, I know. M we, Mark's about to say, I've got to run, go and turn on the server. 
<laughs> yeah, Mark, you're, you're going to get to wrap us up again. All right. I appreciate that. Uh, and I apologize for stealing the, the last minute. Um, we have yet to really discuss uh, where potential breaking points are in some of the big assumptions uh, we're all making. Even if we don't recognize mm -hmm. and say those assumptions as assumptions, we're making assumptions that because it's hard to do X, our only option is to leverage public cloud. We're not looking at what the potential opportunity is of X, what the value associated with X will be, and what that might mean to breaking assumptions because people wanna get there, people can't afford to get there using the traditional methods. So they're gonna to have to break assumptions and find new ways to get there. And those mm -hmm. companies that do that first, especially as we talk about uh, adoption of edge and digital transformation, in general, are the ones that are likely to win. Those that attempt to maximize what they already know and stretch it out over new horizons are likely going to lose in the long term. But is that innovation in software? No, oh, it's innovation in, in software. It's innovation in hardware handling. It's an innovation in deployment. It's innovation in how to adopt and manage low code and no code applications <clears throat> that match a corporate architecture in the back end and, and, and align with security. I mean, there are so many places where the opportunity to break the existing paradigm about what is assumed for a successful deployment. Um, there is just too much money out there right now that isn't being addressed effectively, that uh, we're, we're not going to wait for the cloud providers to put their ham-handed fists all over it and take it all uh, yeah. and, and have it cost us 50 to 100% more than it really needs to. Yeah, even more than that, their ham-handed fists all um, have lenses that point into their own infrastructure absolutely and services, right. That's which, right. which, That's which have gotten right. to a, a point now that it they're, they're actually now have their own inertia in how those things work. And so, yeah. right. And I think this is this is the thing, right, Simon, you asked me why. Um, yeah, yeah we, 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 gotta, we gotta wrap this up. Um, the, the idea that these giant clouds are gonna stay nimble and stay customer focused. No, they're not, they won't is, because well, there's- The giant clouds are legacy already. And, and this is why 2030 is so important, and we need to keep looking at what those, what where the so, where the cracks are. To my are mind, the, the reason the, that they will become slow is really availability. I mean, you see, whenever somebody does something wrong, right, the whole thing falls over. So they're going to get very cautious about rolling out updates and new features. And that's gonna, that's the challenge with any of these big money. Even what Slack was down the first Tuesday, first right. first so, first so day you, of the year. Simon, are you saying that the SLA is their is is their in some sense is their downfall, their yes. enemy? Yes. Interest. Yeah. So so they'll begin become very slow. <clears throat> what was surprising to me about the last big Amazon <clears throat> outage was that they were internally massively dependent on kinesis yeah and tell fantastically and they they paid a very big price for that huge yeah yeah and 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 as they grow those dependencies become bigger and larger bigger. and larger yeah right the good thing is they are using formal methods to try and do checking but still they have to go very slowly yeah well, you know, the, 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 the complexity factor just explodes with, you know, the approach that they've taken to, to architecting all of this. So they have yeah. no choice but to go by, by necessity. And the, the thing that then gets fascinating from that is by using these massive, massive platforms, you are inheriting their complexity. Yeah. For what could have actually been a very simple or at least you have to be aware of the potential failure modes of their platform. Which, which of course, they are right? going to expose to you without, you know. <laughs> yeah. And they're That's not right. even aware of their potential failure modes. So it's like. <laughs> they can't, right. they're right, they're eyes and bugs. Yeah. And this is a really good place to pick it up for next time. I think we're, right, the, the question of why and how things are going to fail um, or drive, you know, we, if we don't understand that, then we, we can't build 
the next system. No, I agree. All right, everybody. I love these talks. Thank I love them too. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Good to see you. Everyone. Bye. Yep. Thank you for listening to uh, the Cloud 2030. Um, as always, this is a fantastic place where we vet these really important ideas about how things are going to change in our industry. And we are going to keep teasing this apart and looking for the motivations people have for changing the status quo, which means just giving everything to major cloud providers. Um, so if you want to join, please do. Uh, The2030.cloud, uh, RSVP, get notified about these meetings. Uh, they're Thursday mornings uh, very consistently. And uh, we also have a DevOps Lunch and Learn where you can hear more about what's going on in day-to-day -day technology. Uh, we're talking about infrastructure as code, probably starting talking about GitOps and serverless and how those things shape our day-to-day -day work environment. Thanks.